Good morning and welcome to Living Faith, Full Gospel Baptist Church in our worship service for January 21st, 2024. We welcome you to our home and to our church on behalf of Pastor Clearness Moore. I'm Elder Renee Moore, and we are so grateful to God for another opportunity to share his word with you. As you prepare yourselves and get the family gathered and get your Bibles warmed up, we're going to share a song, an old song uh, that we think is appropriate this morning and for the topic that we'll be sharing. If you know it, sing along with me. It's a simple song. If you don't know it, it's a good one to learn. Somebody pray for me, had me on their mind, took the time and prayed for me. I'm so glad they prayed. Yes, I'm glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. Grandmama prayed for me, had me on her mind, took the time and prayed for me. I'm so glad she prayed. Yes, I'm glad she prayed. I'm so glad she prayed for me. Granddaddy prayed for me, had me on his mind, took the time he prayed for me. I'm so glad he prayed. Yes, I'm glad he prayed. I'm so glad he prayed for me. Our people prayed for me, had me on their mind, took the time they prayed for me. I'm so glad they prayed. Yes, I'm glad they prayed. I'm so glad they prayed for me. King Jesus prayed for me. Scripture says he did. He had me on his mind. He took the time he prayed for me. And I'm so glad he prayed. Yes, I'm glad he prayed. I'm so glad he prayed for me. Amen. Aren't you glad for the prayers that have gone up for us and for the prayers we go to send up over others? Thank you, Lord, for the gift of prayer. We're going to share a prayer this morning from our dear friend and sister in Jackson, Mississippi, Alexandra Landing. It'll be our opening prayer this morning. And if you will, pray with us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for the opportunity for a fresh start. We thank you for your word because it is the standard for our lives. Forgive us our sins, those we know we've committed and those we don't know we've committed. Continue to show us grace and mercy in those times of weakness. I decree and declare stress, disease, envy, jealousy, heartache, heartbreak, confusion, and any situation or concern that does not bring peace must leave our lives. We will not walk around with a feeling of hurt and defeat because we know victory is in you, no matter what our situation looks like. God, we see you moving in situations. We see things unveiling before our eyes. We just ask that you continue to bring all things into order. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 and 9 states, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. 
God, we give ourselves and our families to you. Continue to bless us according to our faith and show us that you are God. We love you and we praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Welcome again, Living Faith, to our service for this morning. We apologize. We had some problems trying to get on Facebook Live, but we are recording this and we will share it with everyone on YouTube later on on our YouTube channel. By the way, if you would be so kind, if you would go to the Living Faith YouTube channel and subscribe to it, there's a button on there that says subscribe. If you would subscribe to it, we're trying to get up to enough subscribers where we can broadcast live on YouTube, which would make it a lot easier for a lot more people to join us in our broadcast. Some people can't get on Zoom. Some people can't get it on Facebook, but just about everybody can access YouTube. So if you would help us out sometime this week, go to YouTube. If you're not already a subscriber, subscribe. I'll share the link later on and uh, encourage your friends and relatives to subscribe. It's free and you can always have access to all of our videos, Pastor Moore's heart to heart messages, our Bible study messages. They're all there on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. This morning, Pastor has asked me to share with you all about the importance of family, the importance of family. So that's exactly what we're going to talk about this morning. And our focus scripture comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version this morning. And the word of the Lord says, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. Amen. What does it mean to be part of the household of God? Let's, we're going to talk about that this morning. We're going to think about that some. Having been snowed and iced in most of us for a week or more, many of us have enjoyed or endured forced family time. Now, for some, this has been a good time. We're rediscovering each other. We're learning more about each other. We're enjoying one another's company. But of course, for others, it may have been more unpleasant, tense. For some people, being locked in the house with relatives can be dangerous or even traumatic. But family was the first and most important social institution or unit given to human beings. The family is where most of us first learn what it means to be loved and to love. It's where we first learn to exist with other people, to share, to cooperate, to communicate, to laugh together, to cry together, to comfort someone else and to be comforted. For many of us, family is where we first learn how to work. Remember chores, the value of work. We were first taught to take on responsibility. We learned how to trust, how to be trustworthy. But most of all, family is where we first learned about God. We first learned to worship him and to honor God by listening and watching our parents and our grandparents. In fact, the Bible teaches us that this is the primary responsibility of family, and particularly of parents, is to teach our children to reverence and worship God. And we're to do that through our words and our examples. Now, recently, my husband and I, we're both very interested in history. We're big history people. 
we were looking back at what black families of the past, including our own families, experienced and the powerful faith that got them through. During most of the history of this country, black families were deliberately torn apart. The demonic ill logic of slavery argued that black people were not really humans. Therefore, our fathers and our mothers were denied even the basic human rights promised in the Declaration of Independence. Slave marriages were not legal. They were not legally sanctioned. Children, even babies and other family members could be sold away, never to be seen again. Family members could be killed, beaten, or traded at the whim of the owner. We were property. Yet, our four parents persisted. They did get married. They did try to raise their children. Some risked their lives to escape or fought for their freedom. A lot of people don't talk about that part. And that of their family members. After the end of the Civil War in 1865, tens of thousands of newly freed Black people began searching for their relatives who had been sold or separated from them during slavery. They tried to reunite their families and some of them were successful. Many black couples went to the local officials to get a formal marriage license for the first time. My mother's family, for example, descends from a black enslaved couple named Dennis and Jane, who took their children from a Tennessee plantation to Canada in order to live free. And like many of the people who traveled the Underground Railroad, they were led by their faith and they took that faith with them and taught it to their descendants. Now understanding that kind of history, looking at what our families have had to struggle through to get where we are now, and I'm sure all of you could look at your families and see a similar history, it should help us to see our current family situations more clearly. There's a reason why we are where we are now. But to really understand the importance of the family, we need to go back to the original plan. Let's go back to the very beginning. God chose to create us. God chose to redeem us and save us. That the almighty creator of the universe made those decisions, we are important to God. And our creator declared from the beginning that man, human beings, should not be alone. Genesis 2 and 18. He says it's not good for man to be alone. So what did he do? He created a helper. And that helper, woman, was also able to bear children. God, Psalm 68, 6 says, God sets the solitary, the lonely, in families. God intends for us to be in families most of all in his family. Throughout the Bible, God expresses his deep concern for widows, orphans, and fatherless children. God did not intend for us to go through this life alone on our own. God did not create or design families or our homes to be sites of abuse or torment. Families were created for our well-being. Families were created to teach us how to relate to God and to each other because that is God's intention, that we all be one family. Now, of course, if you know the Bible, you know that there have been problems in families from the start. Families are made up of human beings. Us, you, me, and all our humanness. But that's exactly why we need family. We need the people who know us best and have seen us at our worst and love us anyway. There's so many things we as humans have to learn. We're not born knowing some things. We have to learn things and we're supposed to learn them first within our families. We have to learn how to forgive. We have to learn how to be forgiven. We have to practice being patient with ourselves and with others. 
We have to learn not to be selfish. You know, you have to teach babies not to be selfish and how to share. We have to learn to pick up behind ourselves. And all the mothers said, amen. We have to learn that other people don't exist to serve us. We have to learn that we need to do for others. We need people around us to teach us to say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Let me help you, please. Thank you. Those are lessons you learn by being around people. And the first people you learn those lessons from are your family. Parents, grandparents, we're responsible for teaching and modeling these things. Children have to learn that no means no. That's why so many adults don't understand that no means no. Children have to learn that everything will not go their way. Children have to learn that they have to learn how to lose a game, how to lose an argument without hate or violence. You learn that at home. According to Jesus, according to Jesus, the two most important purposes in human life are to love God with everything in us and to love our neighbors, those around us, those with whom we come in contact, to love them just as much as we love ourselves. The Bible does tell us to love ourselves, but we're not supposed to love ourselves more than we love the ones around us. Love is the greatest commandment, and it is the most excellent way, and love never fails. It is not by accident that the Holy Spirit uses family terms to describe our relationship with God and with each other. God is referred to as our father. He is our father. Christ is our brother. Fellow believers in the scripture are referred to as our brothers and sisters. That's what we're supposed to call each other. Brothers and sisters in Christ. The church, which is, the, I'm talking about capital C church, all the believers in Christ all over the world for all time. The church is described in the Bible as the bride of Christ. When we accept Jesus as our savior, we become part of a huge family reunion. We become part of the household of God. The word of God teaches us how we're supposed to treat each other in the family of God. And here's an important point. How we treat others is not necessarily based on how they act. We cannot control people. We cannot control how they treat us, how they act. We can control our actions and our responses to people. And our tendency is to focus on how others treat us or to wonder about what others are thinking about us. We spend a lot of time wondering what people are thinking about us. And we use that to justify our reactions towards them. But God holds us accountable for obedience to his word. He holds us accountable for whether we treat others and think about them the way God told us to treat them and the way he told us to think about them. You no, know, he told us how we're supposed to think about people. What if Jesus treated us the way we treat him? Remember 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 states, we love him because he first loved us. He died for us while we were yet sinners. That passage in 1 John goes on to say, if someone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, how can he love God, whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. The Apostle John also challenges us in 1 John 3 and 17, that whoever has this world's goods, and other you got stuff, and sees his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? 
you have the ability to help somebody, you see they need help and you refuse to help them, especially a brother or sister in Christ, where's the love of God in you? God loved us even when we were acting ugly towards him and towards other people. All right, I'll testify to that one. God loved me even when I was acting ugly towards him and towards other people. It's the love of God in us, the power of the Holy Spirit working through us that makes us lovable and able to love others. We're to pray for each other, comfort each other, bear one another's burdens, forgive one another. Family is important. And that includes our church family. We're not perfected yet. We're all growing in Christ. Jesus is the cornerstone of the house. We have the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And we have the eternal word of God to help transform us and our families. So let's pray for our families. Let's pray for families that are in trouble. Let's pray for families that are struggling. Let's pray for our church family that we will all walk and grow in love. Let's close in prayer. Father, we lift up every person who is listening to this message this morning. We lift up every family represented on this broadcast, those who are here now and those who will watch us in the future. We ask you, Lord, to strengthen us. We thank you for the gift of family. We thank you, Lord, for your wisdom, for you decree that we need it to be in families. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of family. We ask you, Father, to forgive us for how we have treated others around us. Forgive us for how we have not shown your love and your patience, your mercy that you showed to us. We have not shown it to others. Help us, Lord, to deal with family members. Help us, Lord, to deal with those who mistreat us or unkind or, or heartless or seem heartless. Help us, Lord, to react to them the way you react to us, with mercy, with patience. Help us to show the love of God. Help us to be in the world, Lord Jesus, what you were in the world. Help us, Lord, to unite our families. Help us to unite families that are torn apart. Help us, Lord, to remember the fatherless, the motherless. You, Lord, are there for us, and you told us to be there for each other. Help us to comfort those who are in mourning. Help us to pray for those who need healing. Help us to feed those who are hungry. Help us, Lord, to be your hands and your feet, and most of all, to be your heart. Help us, Lord, and we will yield to your Holy Spirit, and we will do what you guide us to do. We will obey your word. And we will give you glory and honor in all things and at all times. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. Have a great week and be blessed.